Hi and thank you very much for watching. This is part 4 of this series and in today's video, having 2020 vision of the past 6 years, we will revisit the Revelation 12 sign to look at the meaning and purpose of this sign that was probably one of the most anticipated and first of the end time signs that are clearly referenced in God's word. September 23rd 2017 passed rather uneventfully and many who were waiting for this sign with great anticipation had to deal with a subsequent disappointment. So the question we have to ask is this, was the Revelation 12 sign that appeared in the heavens in 2017 real? Or was it simply a coincidence that a very unique star formation as described in Revelation 12 formed in the heavens at that specific time? In 2017 I think most watchmen were so eager for this sign to occur and knowing that it is a heavenly sign that is specifically described in the Bible most including myself did not really take the time to dig into God's word to the level required to understand its true meaning. However, when we do, the message becomes very clear and I hope you will watch this video to the end as we look at what God's word shows us about this sign and how it applies to us in 2023 and how our Heavenly Father used this sign to confirm what he showed us in Daniel 12. Before we delve deeper into this, let's first consider what he said in the first few verses of Revelation 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing and birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. This passage begins by sharing the configuration of this very unique heavenly sign that we witnessed in 2017, and associating this with the start of a birthing process. The actual birth is only described a couple of verses further on, but only after the appearance of another heavenly sign known as the Red Dragon. What nobody asked about in 2017 was the length of the birthing process, as this passage clearly tells us that the red dragon is another heavenly sign that appears at the time of the birth. When we study God's word we understand that one of the supernatural qualities of the Bible is that it contains everything needed to interpret itself. And in Ecclesiastes we are told how our heavenly father requires the use of repeating patterns, allowing us to interpret similar future occurrences of a model or a pattern that occurred in the past. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done, is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new, it hath been already of old time which was before us. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be for ever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. So how do we go about looking for answers regarding the length of this unquantified birthing process in God's word? Well, we start by looking for connections to other passages in which the aspects and attributes that are mentioned in Revelation 12 are addressed and expounded on. And this should not only answer our question, but also provide further insight into the matter. That is how God's word works. Each passage represents a puzzle piece that we have to connect to other passages, allowing us to see the bigger picture or to arrive at a deeper understanding of what is said. With today's Bible study tools like eSword, it could not be easier to study God's Word in this way. The Bible tells us that our Heavenly Father declares the end from the beginning, and we already know that the Revelation 12 sign is a fulfillment of what was prophesied in Genesis 3, and of course, 
This is not the only instance of this repeating pattern being fulfilled. We see another fulfillment of this prophecy when Jesus defeated the dragon or Satan on the cross. Jesus is the seed of the woman referred to in Genesis 3, and his birth was a miracle given that Jesus was born from a virgin. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Everything that we read about in Revelation 12 is also addressed in Genesis 3. And this would then be the obvious place to begin to look for answers to our question. Genesis 3 represents the source of the pattern for which we see a repeating instance in Revelation 12. Let's consider what God said to the dragon, the man, and the woman in Genesis 3. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat, all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. In this passage we see how God declares the serpent and its offspring the enemy of humanity and its offspring, and that both man and woman are destined to labor with sorrow. And this of course is specifically confirmed in the passage from Revelation 12, where the woman experiences pain and sorrow in her labor through which she is bringing forth her child. When we search the scriptures for more information regarding labor and sorrow, we find something interesting in Psalm 90, where we encounter the first instance in which labor and sorrow are connected to time. Moses explains that labor and sorrow starts at the end of a 70-year period, and it just so happens that the heavenly sign of Revelation 12 appeared in the heavens in the year when Israel celebrated their 70th year back in the land that God promised to them. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. We can now begin to see how the Bible provides additional information to interpret itself, and when we assemble the matching puzzle pieces, we broaden our understanding. There is a big secret hidden in this passage when we read this in conjunction with Genesis and Revelation. When we consider what Revelation and Genesis show us, Moses is telling us that once the 70-year mark is reached, any extension to that time has to do with those aspects that one would associate with a birthing process. The maximum time that we can associate with this birthing process according to Psalm 90 is 10 years. But Moses hints at this time being shorter than 10 years, given that he states that the extension is soon cut off and we fly away. Then if we read Matthew 24, we see that Jesus refers to the beginning of sorrows. This of course points to the onset of this birthing process that is obviously linked to the Revelation 12 sign. And looking back at the events that occurred over the past six years, we see that everything that Jesus mentioned has certainly occurred in the world with specific aspects that we can highlight that differentiate the last six years from other periods which may have had similar applications. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled 
for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. One thing that stands out for me from this passage, confirming its application to the world that we live in today, is the deception that has permeated society since 2017, and which we discussed in more detail in previous videos in this series. The number of lies and their impact on the world over the past six years have been at levels that have never been witnessed before, and through these most of the world has been deceived into believing lies. Also, all of the aspects that Jesus mentioned in this passage have occurred simultaneously, especially over the past three years. So what additional information do we have thus far by using God's word for additional detail on the Revelation 12 sign? We have the heavenly sign that is described in Revelation 12, which appeared in the year when Israel celebrated their 70th year back in the land that our Heavenly Father promised to Abraham. Psalm 90 tells us that an extension to those 70 years can reach up to 80 years, but that it is cut short at some point, and will involve attributes that one will associate with a birthing process. Jesus' description of events that are associated with the beginning of the birthing process has been fulfilled over the past six years, just as he said it would. But the question still remains, how long is the actual birthing process? And if this process is cut short before it reaches 80 years, what else does God's word show us? In Jeremiah 31, we read how God promises to sow the seed of men and beast into the twelve tribes of Israel, linking this passage to Israel's return to the land of Israel. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. In this passage, our Heavenly Father describes Judah and Israel as a field in which seed will be sown, and just as we have seen in Daniel chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 13, here we once again have to do with the mixing of seeds, or tares, being sown into the wheat during the end times as prophesied by both Daniel and Jesus. This delineation between man and beast is also found in God's harvest laws, where we see how at the time when the owner of the field gathers in his harvest, he instructs to leave a portion of that harvest to the poor, the stranger, and the beasts of the field, especially when considering the seven-year harvest cycles. And six years thou shalt sow thy land, and shalt gather in the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat. And what they leave, the beasts of the field shall eat." In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard. This connection is the key we were looking for that assists us in understanding the time appointed for the birth in Revelation 12. As with a harvest, the man-child that is birthed is the owner's property or portion that is taken to heaven. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. In the last verse of this passage, we see how the gleanings of this harvest are described. The remnant of the woman's seed can be compared to the gleanings or the corners of the harvest that remain in the field after the owner's portion is removed, and this becomes the property and target of the enemy. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you have not seen the series on the harvest and temple models, and how these teach us about what the Bible terms the first resurrection, please watch it for deeper insight into this. Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law, and therefore we can know that when specific instructions are given that connect them to important events in God's word, our Heavenly Father will certainly fulfill those events according to His laws, and the instructions provided in Exodus 23 will certainly apply to this heavenly birthing process or harvest. Looking back at the Revelation 12 sign today, we are only a few days away from completing six full years since the onset of the labor process on September 23, 2017, and according to God's word, this time frame cannot extend into the seventh year without a birth and a period of rest that must first follow, 
and our Heavenly Father also promising that the birth will not be delayed past the time stipulated in His Word. Before she traveled, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth, and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth, and shut the womb, saith the Lord? Based on what is written in this passage, we can know that God will not allow the labor process to continue beyond the six-year mark without causing the man-child to be brought forth. Exodus 23 mentions that the seventh year is set aside for the poor and the beasts of the field, giving them an opportunity to gather in, and this is further confirmed in Leviticus 23, which points to the time at which the man-child is birthed. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Based on God's harvest laws, and seeing how these principles are demonstrated in the Revelation 12 sign, we know that the maximum allowable period for labor that the woman in the heavens would be given to bring forth her child, following the 70 years mentioned in Psalm 90, is six years. God's word further shows us that our bridegroom is very patient and will wait until the very last moment before he reaps the harvest, and this is shown to us in James 5 verse 7, where his patience is associated with both the harvest and his next visitation. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. It would make sense, then, that our bridegroom would wait until the very last moment before fulfilling his word. This point would be reached at the completion of six full years, and the last day of labor and sorrow would then fall on September 22, 2023, after which the birth has to happen. The Bible also has quite a bit to say about the events that follow the birth of the man-child, in light of the passages that we considered. When we look at current global events such as artificial intelligence displacing jobs, strange illnesses increasingly affecting people, and new illnesses that are anticipated by those who are supplying the cures, the entire world being set on fire supposedly as a result of a changing climate, bank closures and restricted access to bank accounts, diminishing monetary use, food and energy shortages, and more crises introduced every day to further clamp down on personal freedoms, the following passage becomes very applicable to those who would insist on laboring beyond this six-year limit. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The term, the Great Reset, is often mentioned in the media by those who serve the enemy. However, when we know that our Heavenly Father requires a period of rest, following six years of laboring with sorrow in a field or a harvest, and knowing now how the seven-year harvest cycle applies to the Revelation 12 sign, it stands to reason, and it is simply just logical, that September 23, 2023, would be the perfect day on which our Heavenly Father will enforce a period of rest over the world for which the enemy would want to take credit. What we know is that we will end up with many more unemployed, and uh, particularly also people in the grey economy, which are not counted for, uh, who lose their jobs. So we will see definitively a lot of anger uh, already now, but probably increase by the end of the year, uh, because this crisis will be with us until we really have found a remedy. So um, we have to prepare for a more angry world. And uh, how to prepare? Uh, it means to take the necessary action to create a fairer world. 
um, to see that uh, we provide everybody with uh, decent access to the health system, um, that we make sure that those people uh, who are really left behind, uh, and I'm not speaking only on national levels, I'm speaking also internationally. If I see now uh, the tragedy in some of the emerging countries like South Africa, like some countries in East Asia, I think it's all, uh, I, I don't have too many remedies. The, the remedies have to be discussed through dialogue by the stakeholders of our global system. But um, I just see the need for such a dialogue and I see the need for action. I see the need for a great reset. Not being able to work is not the only thing to look forward to for those who find themselves on the earth at the time when the spirit of rest is enforced. Isaiah 13, among other passages in God's word, has more to say about what to expect. And notice how what is said is once again associated with the birthing process that we see in Revelation 12. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that traveleth. They shall be amazed one at another, their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, the sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine." and I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place, and the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Both John and Isaiah describe darkness that emerges when the birthing occurs, compelling the world to rest, and these events coinciding with removal of the world's light. In today's context, who embodies the light of the world? According to God's word, those equipped with oil in their vessels who radiate God's light into the world amidst these circumstances. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When we now consider the information regarding the Revelation 12 sign again and how studying God's word in a little more detail assists us in obtaining a better and more insightful understanding of this sign's meaning and purpose, the time frame associated with the woman's laboring process which cannot exceed six full years until her offspring or fruit must be produced provides further confirmation down to the day for the time frame provided to Daniel by Gabriel. Both of these time frames having different starting points and not connected to each other in any way arrive at the same conclusion. The likelihood of the laboring process ending on September 22, 2023 is not only highly likely but also strongly supported by God's instructions. In addition, September 23rd not only marks the beginning of a year of rest but it also falls on a Sabbath day further emphasizing the period of rest associated with the upcoming events. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. If we approach the Revelation 12 sign from a different perspective, we could also say that we understand that the red dragon seeks to devour or destroy a child that is born. And if our understanding is correct, it involves a period of six years during which the child's life would be in danger. In the seventh year, the child becomes a ruler and the danger to the child is then removed. If this understanding is correct, then it stands to reason that our Heavenly Father would also provide us with a model in His Word to confirm this understanding for us. Now it just so happens that there is exactly such an instance described to us in 2 Kings 11, which is repeated in 2 Chronicles chapter 22. And I want to thank Andy J 91 for sharing this with me as this is simply amazing. In these passages we read about Joash, who was hidden from a metaphorical dragon, right after birth for a period of six years. The dragon in this case was the previous king's mother, who executed the royal bloodline. But Joash was hidden from her for exactly six years. Joash was then crowned as the king of Israel in his seventh year. And this crowning was marked with the blowing of trumpets on a Sabbath day, and it involved watchmen marking a time of rest that followed his persecution by the dragon, who was then slain once Joash was crowned king. I will share some passages from 2 Kings in which some of the events that one can associate with Revelation 12 are highlighted, and I would encourage you to read the entire chapter for yourself to see how these events mirror what is shown to us in Revelation 12, but especially the aspects that turn this story into a model that applies to our time, and which confirms our understanding of the time frame that is associated with Revelation 12 sign. And when Athaliah the mother of Ahaziah saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he was with her hid in the house of the Lord six years, and Athaliah did reign over the land. And in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds with the captains and the guard, and brought them to him into the house of the Lord, and made a covenant with them, and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord, and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, saying, this is the thing that ye shall do. A third part of you that enter in on the Sabbath shall even be keepers of the watch of the king's house. And he brought forth the king's son, and put the crown upon him, and gave him the testimony. And they made him king, and anointed him, and they clapped their hands, and said, God save the king. And when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar, as the manor was, and the princes and the trumpeters by the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. And Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, Treason, treason! And all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was in quiet. And they slew Athaliah with the sword beside the king's house. Seven years old was Jehoash when he began to reign. We now have three independent witnesses in God's word telling us exactly when to expect our bridegroom's visitation. These witnesses are not related to each other, but all of them point to the exact same day on which we should be ready to meet our bridegroom. And the day that our Heavenly Father is highlighting for us is September 23rd of this year. In Daniel 12, we see how our Heavenly Father uses the pattern that He provided to Israel to announce the timing of His first visitation, to also announce the timing of His second visitation. In Revelation 12, we see how the harvest model applies to the woman in whom the seed of man is sown, and where the owner of the harvest collects his portion after the maximum allowed time frame of six years, leaving the field and the remnant of that seed to the poor and the beast of the field in the seventh year. 
In 2 Kings 11, we see how our understanding of the six-year period associated with the Revelation 12 sign is confirmed in the story of Joash, whose life was in danger for six years by a metaphorical dragon, until Joash was crowned king in his seventh year, and the threat to his life ended when the previous king's mother was executed. Given these three witnesses, we have a situation in which the following passage would apply. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The evidence, in my opinion, is really overwhelming, and even though my understanding could still be flawed, I would certainly ensure that I am ready to meet our bridegroom on the day that is pointed out to us by these three witnesses, and I hope that you will do the same. If you are unsure about your readiness, Please watch this video in which we see what our bridegroom expects of us at his arrival. A final question that I have been asked and that I would like to mention is this. What about the model provided in Noah's case where he entered the ark seven days before the rain came over the earth? And should we not expect a similar situation in our case given that Jesus specifically said that in the end times it will be as in the days of Noah? It is certainly possible that our Heavenly Father may remove his portion from this world seven days before the rain comes over the world. But given that Gabriel gives a very specific time frame in Daniel chapter 12 that points to the day of our bridegroom's second visitation, I do not see how anything could happen before 1290 days have been fulfilled, as this would deviate from the model that was given for our understanding. Something else that I find very interesting is that when we look at Jesus' fulfillment of the spring feasts, which I believe occurred in 34 AD, it happened at the time of the spring equinox, and not only was it marked by a lunar eclipse, but on the same day there was also a three-hour solar eclipse. If we look at September 23rd this year, it coincides with the fall equinox, showing us a repeating model when compared to our bridegroom's first visitation. And it also falls on a Sabbath day. And I expect there will once again be an unexpected solar eclipse on this day. Just as shown in this film from 1986 where a newspaper headline speaks of an unexpected solar eclipse that occurs on September 23rd. On the 23rd day of the month of September, in an early year of a decade not too long before our own, the human race suddenly encountered a deadly threat to its very existence. Well, that is all for today. I hope that this information has blessed you and that you are as excited as I am to meet our wonderful and amazing bridegroom who reveals his secrets to those who seek him and desire above all to be with him. God looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand that did seek God. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless.